for that warm introduction. Uh, yes, I, uh, I will be speaking about Bill C-7 and uh, I, I will qualify uh, as uh, Dr. Sfar Tang said uh, that I speak for myself, uh, but I don't speak for uh, the Briere, uh, who which I serve as a director. Um, and I will be speaking on Bill C-7 and in particular, what I would like to do is to take a bird's eye view of what I think some of the key themes are and some of the key pitfalls. And I'd also like to have a little bit of fun at the beginning uh, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so as, as was mentioned, I'm a lawyer in Ottawa and my contact with palliative care and end of life wishes is through many of my clients, the majority of my clients, for whom I help prepare wills and powers of attorney for substitute decision-making at uh, often at the end of life. So I've been there at the hospital bedside taking instructions from clients. Um, and I've seen uh, what they go through and lived part of that with them. So to begin, I would like to introduce uh, a term. The term is an aptonym. Some of you may know what this means. Some of you uh, may hear this for the first time, but I was interested to learn in law school of all places that an aptonym is a word that is fitting. So it can be a name, for example. And I'm gonna circle back to this with respect to the Carter decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2015. So I'll give you an example of another court case, which I think is an aptonym. So in a criminal law decision by the name of R versus Noble, so the Queen or Regina versus Noble, um, in 1997, the Supreme Court of Canada held that a witness's silence cannot be used against them as evidence of guilt. And so that struck me as having something noble in it that first, it seems noble that someone's silence cannot be used against them. And it can also be noble for someone to remain silent because of the dictates of their conscience. And so when I was thinking about this earlier today, I thought back to St. Thomas More, whom you can see in the um, portrait behind me. St. Thomas More is the patron saint uh, for lawyers among other physicians. And St. Thomas More is well known for having held the line, so to speak, before King Henry VIII in defense of the rule of law and also in the defense of the dictates of his conscience at the time. So St. Thomas More remained silent when he was uh, required by the king to make an oath about the propriety of the king's decision to annul his own marriage. And so St. Thomas uh, held firm in silence and refused because of the dictates of his conscience and because of the, his commitment to the idea that men should be governed by rules and laws, not by the whims of men, however capricious or arbitrary. So I bring up St. Thomas More, not just because I'm having a bit of fun with the aptonym, uh, but also because I believe St. Thomas More provides us today, perhaps more than ever, with an example to follow in the midst of a world in which it would appear that the guardrails that once formerly helped protect against the inadvertent or careless uh, harm to vulnerable people in a world where it seems those guardrails seem to be coming down. And one of those guardrails, of course, was the or were the provisions in the criminal code that prevented, uh, as Dr. Yarrow Katalik outlined early in his presentation, the criminal code provisions that prevented counseling for a suicide and barred assisted suicide. 
And I use that term advisedly. I'm not comfortable, especially with C7, I'm not comfortable referring to medical assistance in dying uh, because in fact, if it is now being extended to people who are not dying, I have a lot of trouble philosophically and logically getting on that bandwagon. Okay, um, so back to nominative determinism for a moment. The Carter decision of 2015, and I say this with all due respect to the Supreme Court of Canada. Looking at the Carter decision from the point of view of an aptonym, you'll notice that there's one letter that separates Carter from Charter. There are a couple of letters that separate Carter from Carta, as in the Magna Carta, the great charter um, of the year 1215, which is the predecessor to many charters of rights and freedoms around the world, such as the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms from 1982. And so I'm having a bit of fun with the name Carter because it is in a sense a variation or perversion of the term charter. And in my opinion, with great respect to the Supreme Court of Canada, I think that um, there was a serious oversight uh, in that decision, although it does stand as good law. Uh, that is to say, it stands as the law of the land. Um, but if you go back to that decision, I want to give you a bit of a historical overview of that decision. So to understand the Carter decision you have to, of 2015, you have to understand the Rodriguez decision of 1993. So the Rodriguez decision of 1993 also entertained assisted suicide. Miss Sue Rodriguez wanted to die by uh, these means, but was not permitted by the Supreme Court in the Rodriguez case of 93. And if you read the dissenting opinion by then Justice Beverly McLaughlin, then Justice Beverly McLaughlin, before she was the Chief Justice, wrote that by being denied this opportunity, Sue Rodriguez was a scapegoat. She was a scapegoat to society because while others, uh, by vulnerable people, vulnerable people were, were being prevented from dying by assisted suicide, the one who paid the price for that was Sue Rodriguez and all those who wanted to die by assisted suicide but could not. Now, I mentioned this idea of the scapegoat because if you fast forward to the Carter decision, you see the court with, Beverly, with then Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin flipping the law around within a mere 22 years. Now this is noteworthy. The Supreme Court of Canada does not often change course. By the principle of stare decisis, by which higher court decisions are respected by lower court decisions, and that higher court decisions such as the Supreme Court of Canada's decision should remain good law in perpetuity, or let's say long-term, in, in the light of that, it's very unusual that the Supreme Court within only 22 years changed course. It's also noteworthy, with all due respect to Chief Justice McLaughlin, it is noteworthy that in a 2019 memoir published about her life, it was noted that Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin had much difficulty with the fact that her uh, late husband wanted to access assisted dying but could not. And I raise this not to be personally or um, critical, personally critical or critical in a kind of unwarranted way. I raise this because I query whether there was the appropriate amount of distance of uh, what one might call emotional judicial independence without casting any aspersions on the Chief Justice um, or making any personal remarks about her. But you can see that within a short amount of time, the Supreme Court jurisprudence was flipped. In Carter, the court said the reason they were flipping on this matter was because, among other reasons, 77% of Canadians now endorsed assisted suicide, whereas 
1993 with Rodriguez, that wasn't the case. So that in itself is shocking because the Supreme Court of Canada is supposed to be, at least to my mind, as, and as I was taught in law school, is supposed to be an arbiter for human rights, which should not be subject to the whims of public opinion. And furthermore, it is philosophically a rather weak argument to make uh, the bandwagon argument that, for example, so many people are jumping on the bandwagon, we should too. So for those two reasons, uh, the bandwagon argument and the fact that the court is normally supposed to protect against the tyranny of the majority in favor of uh, uh, individual rights, and I'll get into, I'll flush this out a little bit more, um, I do find the Carter decision quite shocking. So back to this scapegoat uh, analogy. So we have this expression in the dissenting opinion by McLaughlin in 93 that Sue Rodriguez is the scapegoat. But I would like you to turn your mind to those in the disability communities who are raising a flag, putting up their hands, and challenging C7, in fact, C14. I want you to turn your mind to those who are under-resourced, under-financed, living in conditions that we understandably do not find acceptable, such as Dr. Sephora Tang outlined in her presentation. I want you to turn your mind to those who would not like to choose assisted suicide, but for the fact that they are socially malnourished and lack the assisted living that they require. So what we've done is we've, we've set up an administrative system. In some of my uh, spare time, I teach a course in administrative law at one of Ottawa's university, Carleton University. And I teach about the administrative state. It's for the most part, a rationally ordered, uh, efficient, uh, there are inefficiencies, but uh, it's, it's, for the most part, a rationally ordered and at least in principle efficient organization, which is depersonalized. And it has a momentum and it has a vector. And so we've set up this administrative state, which includes hospitals and physicians and social workers and checklists and procedures and 90 day waiting periods. Right? And we've set up the system now in motion to advance the cause of assisted suicide. And I flag this because I, I believe that it presents a moral hazard to those on the other side of the equation from Sue Rodriguez, who are at risk of being the new scapegoats, those who don't want to choose assisted suicide but may on account of their lack of assisted living. So what's happened is an administrative state has been set up in partnership with the pharmaceutical industry, with all due respect to pharmaceutical companies, um, in partnership with medical schools and the development of curricula, and in partnership with hospitals and the administrative staff. What you have is what I would call advisedly, the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex being now put to use and set in motion to advance and to facilitate in the absence of proper assisted living, assisted dying and assisted suicide. This I think is a great moral hazard. So we now have a new scapegoat and interestingly, if you look at the numbers, roughly 2%, and the number is growing and it has grown, roughly 2% of deaths are attributable to medical assistance in dying. If you look at uh, the way it's, of course, framed in the official numbers. While the other 98% while the other 98 are obviously not dying from that cause. So now what you've done is you've opened up a medical pharmaceutical industrial system to permit this choice for the 
which now will inadvert which now will inevitably in my opinion catch many of those in the 98% hence why the number will increase and if you look at other countries they'll 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 top off at a certain number but the question is is one person choosing assisted suicide when they would not otherwise have done so if they had the services available and the supports available. Now, we're not asking people to suffer needlessly. That's, that's not what, what taking a stand against assisted suicide is about. It's not. It's about providing the right social supports and medical supports and palliative supports. It's understanding that the wish for a hastened death a desire for hasten death is not always the end of the story, as was outlined in um, the, uh, the, 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 the last presentation. I think it was uh, Bob Park um, who, who, who mentioned that. And so it's understanding that we should be there to help, right, rather than just say no. You know, Dr. Tsvortang brought up the death penalty. I thought that was really good. The strongest argument in my view against the death penalty is one innocent person who has been uh, wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death is too many. And yet we're comfortable setting up a medical pharmaceutical industrial complex it will catch in its turbines, so to speak, at least one innocent person who would not choose assisted dying, but for the fact that they don't have assisted living. And we say, well, there are safeguards. There are 10-day waiting periods, now 90-day waiting periods. Excuse me, but the safeguards do not prevent someone from, quote unquote, willingly choosing assisted suicide because they lack the supports they need. In fact, the legislation requires that the patient be informed of social supports, not provided social supports. And as Dr. Sforateng said so aptly in her presentation, the Canada Health Act requires the provision of assisted suicide, but not palliative care. And 6.2% of those accessing assisted suicide, also have access to psychiatric care, 6.2%. I mean, this is just, to my way of thinking, upside down. So if you're going to provide assisted suicide, at the very least, the condition precedent to doing so should be, I would humbly submit, the provision of proper assisted living. I worked with an economist once when I did a, a stint at a think tank here in Ottawa called the Institute on Governance. And this economist was very bright and he was studying the economics of public transit. And he came up with this thought experiment. He said, if you have 12 checkout lines at a grocery store and each of them has an average time of 14 minutes and you introduce a new checkout line and its time is always four minutes. What's the new average wait time in that grocery store? And the answer is four minutes because everyone will choose the four minute line which will always remain four minutes no matter how many people are in it. And so his argument was about public transit and getting people onto public transit and off the roads because public transit could theoretically maintain the same uh, travel time. Transplant that notion to assisted suicide, where yes, it's inefficient and costly to provide assisted living, but here we're presenting a new, call it magic checkout line without trying to be crass or wanting to be cavalier, introducing this new option without properly <laughs> addressing the other options. And to me, it's a great moral hazard. And so we can reasonably ask ourselves, what's happening? 
I think there are a lot of things happening and historians and sociologists and psychiatrists and philosophers and ethicists will and should all be involved in helping to unravel and unpack what is happening. Um, but one of the things I think is happening is reflective bias. I mean, today, yesterday, the uh, Minister of Justice was quoted saying uh, that this was the C7 was, and I'm paraphrasing here, was an opportunity uh, to, to allow autonomy to prevail and to prevent needless suffering. Now that's great as far as it goes. That's a, that's a great notion as far as it goes. But what about the 98%, right? And are we fabricating autonomy? Are we seeing autonomy where in fact there's desperation? And are we facilitating desperation and seeing autonomy at one and the same time? So is there a reflective bias, right? A reflective bias where we see what in fact we appear to ourselves to be, right? We like to be in control. Those passing the laws like to be in control and autonomous, right? These are the ideals. Are we seeing that in the patients who are actually suffering from existential anxiety. I can't make sense of my suffering. I don't understand where I fit in the world. Right? I've been given a dramatic, tragic diagnosis of stage four cancer. I now suffer from uh, a desire for hasten death. Is that person autonomous? Well, certainly to a degree, but my point is Let's be careful in not over overemphasizing, right, and underemphasizing the true vulnerability that's present there. Um, I'd like to leave you, if I have time. I'd like to leave you uh, with a final thought. So we've gone over quite a bit. We've got over the, the idea of an aptonym, uh, Saint Thomas More. Um, gone over Carter and Rodriguez and the idea of these two different scapegoats, the 2% versus the 98%, the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex, uh, the magic checkout line, um, this idea of reflective bias. Lastly, I want to leave you with this thought. I called it the myth of the slippery slope. So we've heard the argument don't worry, we're going to put the safeguards in place. We're not going to go down the slippery slope. And so we had the provision put in by then Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould. Um, I thought it was very apt, given what Carter had said. The Justice Minister put in a limit. Only those whose death is reasonably foreseeable will qualify in addition to the other qualifications set up in Carter. It's taken six years to remove that completely. So you wonder, well, where are we on the slippery slope argument? Now, I would submit to you that as soon as we pass the assisted suicide legislation or the assisted dying legislation, we were already at the bottom of the slope. Why is that? Because in the overwhelming number of cases, and this is from uh, authorities that have spoken publicly on this uh, and that I've spoken privately about and which can be verified, in the majority of cases where patients are seeking an assisted death, they suffer from existential distress, which is a psychological condition, which is at the root of their request for hasten death. So if the physical illness is a part of it, but the existential distress is at the root of it, then we're already providing assisted death on account of what? A psychological suffering. Of course, there are cases of great pain, but with palliative care and the advances in palliative care, we know that by and large, the element of pain can be reduced substantially, and in most cases, satisfactorily. 
So at the very beginning, when we offered it in 015, at the root of, in many cases, in most cases, so I'm told, at the root of the request is a psychological suffering. So we were told, don't worry, we'll put the safeguards. We won't get there. We won't get there to the place where people are offered assisted dying only because of, of their desire for haste and death. I think we were already there when we began the journey. In fact, now the Senate has shown us and now the legislature shows they're ready to go there directly on the books. So I, I, I acknowledge that my talk here may leave uh, some, how shall I say, um, maybe some hopelessness, some feelings of uh, despair. Uh, but you know, think back to St. Thomas More. I think it's incumbent upon every one of us to hold firm in our own lives, in our own practices, whether it's in medicine or law or any other trade or profession or in our personal lives, as parents, um, as friends, as siblings, sons, daughters, fathers, mothers. I think it's incumbent upon us to hold firm in what it is that we believe, even on the pain of great adversity. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to your questions.